I'd like to do something about the microbiome. I have to do something because otherwise Martin will never talk to me ever again. <laughs> so one of the things that happened in Zubiquity is, in fact, I, uh, it was a previous conference that was run by the Marie Bashir Institute. I met a really nice girl called Christine Adler and she's about 32. She just had a first baby. She's on maternity leave at the moment. And I read about her in the Sydney Morning Herald, which is our poshest newspaper, because she had a paper published in Nature Genetics from a PhD. And she worked at Adelaide University, which is a centre of excellence for dental research in relationship to the oral microbiome. And what she did was she went all around the world and collected ancient DNA from people. Okay, from as many, there are centres all around the world that keep old human skulls and old human bones in specially hermetically sealed containers. Now, microbiome work is only possible because of the development of pyrosequencing, massive parallel sequencing. And everybody, well, cat vets have always known the oral cavity is a really complex place. And my most important research mentor in life was a lady called Daria Love. And she was an anaerobic microbiologist. And she did her life's work was characterising the different bacteria present in the gingival cleft of cats. And she discovered about six new species. So Porphyromonas gingivalis, it was called a different thing then, and many bacteroides and Prevotella and Clostridium villosum were all organisms that she characterised. And her principal interest wasn't in what they did in the oral cavity. It turns out that they're all of the causes of cat fight abscesses, and that hadn't been recognised because in the late 60s and early 70s when she did that work, if people had a cat fight abscess, they would culture it aerobically and they'd grow Pastorella multicida and they'd say that was the cause. Now, if they did a gram stain of a pus, they would find there were at least 10 different bacterial morphotypes, spirochetes, gram-positive rods, gram-negative rods, gram-positive cocci, peptostreptococci, bacteroides, porphyromonas. So cat fight abscesses are full of these gingival cleft organisms. Not a big surprise, isn't it? Cat goes up to another cat. Oh! <laughs> right? Deep, festy mouth, teeth goes in, comes out like a dagger, inoculating them, highly reduced environment because the muscle's undergone necrosis. Is your heart rate going faster? Can we record this? No. <laughs> okay. I want this on YouTube. I'll be famous. Okay. Um, and it seals over the top and it's an anaerobic environment like the gingival cleft. And so you get an anaerobic abscess and they're the same organisms that cause pyothorax. And in that case, it's their translocated bacteria that move from the oral cavity down the trachea into the lung. Because all of those cats have got a little bit of pneumonia as well. And maybe Darien's greatest contribution was showing that when you transport horses internationally on jets, that if you tie their head up, they almost always get pneumonia and pyothorax. Because in order for a horse to clear the oropharyngeal flora that's moving down the trachea, they need to put the head down and cough. And so now when they put horses on jets, they tie the head up only when the plane takes off and lands so that they can feed on the ground. So she's an amazing woman that did work. So I wanted to build on the work that she did before because we always knew there were more organisms there that we can grow. Now this is one of those things that's really important to understand. When, when I was at vet school, we thought everything that can grow on an agar plate is a typical bacteria right? And leprosy is really unusual because it won't grow, right? Does that make sense? Like you get, you get pythorax, you culture it anaerobically, you get some anaerobes, you get an abscess, you get some staphs, you get an abdominal infection, you grow some E. coli. Like we're used to the idea you can grow things. But it turns out that of all the bacteria on the planet, we can only grow 5%. Okay, so that's really because my favourite organisms are mycobacteria and fungi, and we can all grow fungi. They grow really well, but mycobacteria, we've got three new species, and we can't grow them for love or money. We've tried everything. And probably we need to grow them inside amoeba or something, because they've evolved not to live in the environment. And it's the same here. So when you do this microbiome work, it's the ability to look at all of the bacteria, not just the ones you can culture. 
So you massive parallel sequence, a little restricted part of a genome, the 16 ribosomal RNA, and all bacteria have got it. It's highly conserved, but the sequence you get from all of them is different. And people that are really good at bioinformatics can then, with very clever high power computers, look at the different distribution of organisms. Now we think about gram negative and gram positive and aerobe and anaerobe, but they call them formiculites and actinomyces and different groups. So what Christina Adler did, she became an expert at pyrosequencing the microbiome of a gingival cleft from H and DNA. Now I don't know if you know, but when people were hunter-gatherers, like in the Paleolithic period, they never had dental caries and they didn't have periodontal disease. They usually got killed when they were 40 or 45 and their teeth were actually in good condition. You know, they might have been punched out by somebody with a bigger stick or something. It wasn't until people started to grow grain and started to have refined carbohydrate in the diet that they developed caries, which isn't a big surprise for those of you that are my vintage. And it's the same largely for periodontal disease. So what Christina did was she looked and showed that there was a flip in the microbiome of the gingival cleft related to the history of the dietary evolution of human beings. So it seemed to me an incredibly logical experiment was to compare the oral microbiome of cats that ate dry food with cats that ate raw food. And the only trouble was that I had to pay for this research. <laughs> okay, now I was foolish enough to fly Andrea's horse Connie to fly from Bristol to Australia. That sent me back $20,000 but I got six. <laughs> so maybe it was a good investment. This, I just got another publication. So I only want to go through this quickly to show you what, because you talk about microbiome work, it, it, it takes a long time to understand what's involved and which people do it, and it requires expertise. So this is the different phylum, you know, Actinobacteria, Bacteroides, I can't recognise formiculites of the gram positives. And then you divide them into these groups and down the bottom you can see how they change with wet food and with dry food. This is probably the most informative diagram and you'll see a lot of diagrams like that if you start reading about the microbiome of the skin, the nasal sinus or the gut. So it's a really terrific way to look at the whole spectrum of bacteria. So what we did to do this work, you'd go up to a cat and you'd get a swab and you'd open its mouth and you'd rub it against the gingival cleft and you'd put it in this special media that preserves the DNA and put it in the freezer and take it down to the dental school at Westmead Hospital. And she would then send it off to a special, she would do the pyrosequencing and send it off to a bioinformatics thing and then they would give all the information back about a month later which she would then subsequently analyse. Now there are 140 different types of bacteria present. Now Daria found six new species. Anybody want to do a PhD? There's 132 more to find. <laughs> and they're all pathogens in catfight abscesses and new pyothorax and pneumonia. And they're probably all sensitive to metronidazole, so maybe it's not important. But if you want to understand the microbiome, this is the type of thing you need to do. And this shows a dendrogram of genetic relationship of all of the bacteria that are present, okay? And the colour codes according to which type of genera that they're part of. But the interesting thing now is that it's a bit like a ferris wheel. So think like, what do you call it, the big eye? The, so, the London eye. Okay, so meat here is red and dry food is purple. And the height of these columns is the relative abundance of these different organisms. Now most people think in people the periopathogens are Porphyromonas gingivalis, Prevotella and certain Treponema species. They're thought to be the big three. So I've got terrible, I've got to brush my teeth all the time, I've got bad periodontal disease. So if you cultured me I'd have a lot of those organisms present. Whereas some of the young people with perfect teeth that had fluoride in the water and all of the advantages in life, you weren't the poor son of Polish immigrants that came to Australia like I was. No, it's all right. I'm just trying to get a laugh, like, you know, it's late in the day. Um, um, you wouldn't have any of those organisms. You would have normal flora. But all cats have got periopathogens. 
But if you feed them dry food, they have more. And the way to express that is in this graph. And there aren't many dots on the graph because that's $5,000 worth of work. <laughs> it's just expensive and it's hours and hours of Christina doing it because she has to develop a library. She has to characterise all of these because they're different to people. They're related to the human organisms, but she needed to group them into taxonomic units, 140 different ones, a lot of analysis, and certainly I couldn't do it. And I would not do this work without having an expert in the area. I'm too old. It's really quite specialised. Now, it's interesting now, don't put this on the YouTube. The trouble is but, but we don't have enough points. But there's a big difference between those two lines. And it wouldn't really surprise you that a cat eating dry food a highly fermentable carbohydrate that can be broken down in an anaerobic environment, a whole variety of acids and, and volatile fatty acids is likely to have a, a different microbiome. So that wouldn't be like a, a big surprise. So all you need to do is to use your common sense and feel the power of the force. Okay, now this, I'm just trying to, like Carolyn worked with me and she does um, a lot of continuing things. A senior veterinary representative from a multinational pet food company looked at me like I'd gone insane when I told her I fed my cats 50% raw meat diet and that I didn't agree with feeding dry food to cats. On a canned raw diet, my cats can be fat at libidum, still retain a trim figure and barely touch the water bowl. As soon as I give them dry food, they become insatiated, obese little monsters that are desperate to drink from the toilet. You see, I can use emotive language and use marketing just like those bastards from Hills. <laughs> okay, this is the grandfather of feline medicine in Australia called Vic Manras, who I had dinner with about two weeks ago. He's a lovely man, much better since he's had his aortic valve replaced, a really good guy that helped feline medicine in Australia. It just goes to show that when you try to fly against the face of nature, especially with a creature that has been resistant to selective change for tens of thousands of years, you will expect trouble. Experience of 40 years of practice and tens and thousands of cats tell me cats on a basically raw meat diet live the longest. Do I have proof? Of course not. <laughs> now, at, I'm sort of almost done. So lunch is coming. Life is good. But I... the the benefit of being 58 is that I don't plan to work for very much longer and if they sack me, well, I'll just spend more time on the farm, okay? Because are you, any of you old enough to see the movie Network? It's a wonderful movie with Peter Finch, a great Australian actor and he, he's a newscaster that basically goes insane while he's reading the evening news and he does really crazy things and he says, I'm mad about the world and I want to do something about it. So a good movie had William Holden and Faye Dunaway and it's, it influenced me and I'm just angry about what's happened. I can't believe that a profession full of people so smart and so dedicated and so insightful as veterinarians just go hook, line and sinker for this bullshit. So I'm interested in why it happens and the mechanisms and the, the, the way it does. And I'm interested in trying to work out a way to affect change. Now, you're doing it better than me because you're actually doing it. I'm doing it with my own cats. And I think I've influenced people in Australia to some extent. But you need to use social media and journalists and the people that you think are your acolytes that are convinced to somehow affect change. Tom Lonsdale's been doing it for a long time. But Tom has a unique style where he can alienate almost everybody <laughs> while, but like he's made an enormous difference in Australia, but like he scares the shit out of everyone, okay? So I think he's done the first part. Now we need different strategies, different voices, different people, old people, young people, male people, female people, people from all cultures and countries that believe that it doesn't have to come from a plastic bag exactly what it is you want to feed them, I'm, I don't mind. But I can't believe the American mantra that everybody goes to a vet school in America thinks you feed Hill Science Diet before you feed them KD before they die. I just can't believe that's what nutrition's about. So that this is Alexei Polden, who's a really clever young man. His father is, what do you call it in England, a silk? We call him senior council, you call him Queen's council, don't you? We're trying to sort of demonetize Australia. So, 
So the really old ones are still Queen's Council, but all the new ones are called Senior Council. And he's, um, his dad is a barrister that is a media barrister. And this guy's doing an intercalated degree in journalism in law. And so he did this wonderful story in Honi Soir. Now Honi Soir is the paper of the newspaper of the University of Sydney. And it used to be when I was a student, you know, we, there'd be thousands of copies everywhere. Now it's an online thing, but it's actually got some really good things. And this is an incredibly good article he did. It turned out, you know, I said we got 80 lectures and then it was down to five lectures. And the five lectures were given by a lovely person. I won't mention who her name is, but she, her, her job was to be the Hills rep. She was a tech vet for Hills. And she gave the lectures in small animal nutrition to the people at the University of Sydney. Now it turns out that the same thing happens in every university in Australia except Charles Sturt University. So there's somebody like that that gives the lectures to the students. Now that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so Alexi went down and Tom Lonsdale, who is actually a brilliantly determined person under freedom of information, has got many of the contracts between the universities and the vet school. And usually they do something for the vicinity of two to four hundred thousand dollars. So it might be a couple of staff members or it might be just the full amount. But what do you get in return to that? You get your rep to give all of the students one version of the truth. And that version of the truth is anything that's raw or natural or doesn't come out of a plastic bag or a hermetically heated steel can is bad. Your cat will die of salmonellosis. It'll fracture all of its teeth from eating bones. And you're the worst person in the world that if you think about doing anything else than that. And what happened in one particular year is some students were working for an organisation like yours that processed food and he put his hand up and asked questions. And she came down on him like a tonne of bricks about telling him that he was wrong. And then the students discuss all this on Facebook. In our day we might have talked about it in the common room, but now they all do it on social media. And like I don't do Facebook and stuff. And it's really interesting to watch it. So he really did a good job and then he did a follow-up story about the privatisation of Sydney University. I don't know if you know, but a corporate practice now runs Sydney University Veterinary Teaching Hospital. Now the corporate people that run Sydney University Veterinary Teaching Hospital is owned by a veterinary group, a corporate group, and the head of that company head just happens to be the distributor of Hills Pet Food. <laughs> Now his name is, you can find it, it's in the common arena because you might put this in YouTube, I actually won't mention it. But how, like, it's not like at Bristol we have Langford Veterinary Services, which is part of the University of Bristol running the hospital as a private entity. This is an external group running the veterinary teaching hospital, the oldest veterinary teaching hospital in Australia. It stinks. That's my alma mater. Okay, so Alexi did a really good story on that. And then... I've been doing some stuff with the media because journalists sometimes are interested in these stories. And that was the first thing I was involved with. This one was actually quite complex. And the gentleman, David Rabenheimer, and a couple of other people at the university did a study where they went, they had, a, they had an honours student. She wasn't doing a veterinary science degree. She was doing a veterinary biosciences degree. Again, I'm reluctant to know what I can say in public, but like one veterinary degree where the people are desperate to become veterinarians, but they can't unless they come in the top 10%. And then you've got a BVSC, soon to be a DVM, because we want to copy America, cause, because we want people from North America to have a degree that they recognise when they come as fee-paying students to Australia. So we're going to change from a BVSC to a DVM. There's no sense of history or anything left anymore. You understand why I'm like Peter Finch in, 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 in network. And so they did this study where they went to the supermarket and they looked at a range of dry food and wet food. And the whole thing about Stephen Simpson and David Rabenham, they use a thing called nutritional geometry. They use a cartography that looks at each food and divides up the proportion of protein versus fat versus carbohydrate. And there's a sort of sweet spot that all of the things should be. And it turned out that about six of the foods were deficient in protein or fat or both. And all of the products I looked at were licensed to be nutritionally complete. 
So they published this in the Australian Veterinary Journal, the journal that I'm currently going to kill the editor about not publishing a really good paper that I submitted there. Um, so if you put on YouTube, wait another month until we... <laughs> so they published this, but they didn't say when the study was done, and they didn't say which foods they were talking about. Now, I don't know about when you did your PhD, but when I did mine, the most important thing about any research project is it must be reproducible. Okay, so if you were studying the auditory acoustic reflex in something or other, you need to say, I used this sprain of rabbit and this was my amplifier and so that somebody else in a different laboratory somewhere else could try to duplicate your findings or extend them or do them further. They didn't tell anybody which foods were which. So when it came out, people knew that there were five brands of food that were shit, <laughs> but they didn't know which ones. <laughs> and they also didn't know that the study was actually done five years ago, so the brands may or may not be on the market because we don't know because we can't look up what brands they were. And I got the shits about that. So I did a little bit of agitation. There were investigative journalists who were very interested in why, because with all due respect, if the public funds research at a publicly funded university, then the publication should leave freely available to everybody and it should inform on the community so they can learn from the study because it probably cost $100,000 to do when you add up the time and the student support and the infrastructure and so forth and so on. The girl that did it, she works for Muriel now as a rep. So she doesn't mind, she wouldn't talk to the media. And everybody else clammed up and wouldn't say a thing. And so anyway, it led, led to a whole um, lot of changes. I, I just quickly show, because I, I try to do stuff. So I write articles about the way I think cats should be fed. And this is in the veterinarian, which is the Australian version of Vet Times. So I've given my version of the truth. And I'd be very happy to give it to Peter. I've given it to him in the past. You know, nothing you don't know, but sort of it's well written. And then Andrea did a similar one, but it's better, where she talks about the welfare con concerns, about how cats have a desire and a pleasure from eating and how it's a good thing. And I think Andrea is more compelling because, like, before she met me, she fed her cats commercial food, mainly wet food, but all commercial food. And unfortunately, coming to me meant raw food was on the agenda. And she became a conversion. And you know from the religious analogies, there's nothing like somebody that changes their religion to have like a devotion to it. And she has, I think, a better voice than me. And I think it's more compelling for somebody that spent her whole life feeding in the traditional way that saw something different but embraced it. And she's very careful about talking about fr freezing things to prevent toxoplasmosis, which is a bigger issue for us because we feed kangaroo and stuff. So that's good. But finally, what happened in relationship to this article in the Australian Veterinary Journal is another journalist called Marcus Strong, who has an interest in nutrition in the human arena and also owns cats. He got onto me th on the phone about the study because I was in the media. And he said, Richard, how can we find out which foods are, feed are safe to feed to cats? And I said, look, this is a study that choice would do. Now, I don't know if you have a choice. The choice is a consumer organisation in Australia. And what they do is they, they'll buy five washing machines and they'll test them and then they'll give you a rating. This one's really good, but it doesn't have a good wash cycle. This one uses a lot of electricity. This one breaks down. So Choice did repeat that experiment, except they only did wet food. And it was very interesting to find their results because I, like my feeling was the dud foods were likely to be dry foods, and they didn't test any. But several of the wet foods were deficient. But because of this study, we now know the nutritional composition of 30 brands of wet food in Australia with all of their macronutrients, including the cal calcium to phosphate ratio and the vitamin D level. And it's really important because another dietary problem we have in Australia is oversupplementation of vitamin D. And I don't know, do you have Safcoal foods here? These isn't a brand you have here. They, they're a premium fish diet but they must have their, uh, their supplementation of vitamin Ds all over the place. But if you feed that diet exclusively, you have a very good chance of giving a cat hypervitaminosis D. So its kidneys and its stomach will become mineralised and calcified. 
and their diets were particularly bad. But I found it really disappointing that a consumer organisation would do better research and be honest and open about it than the people at the <coughs> University of Sydney. And I can't help wondering whether the relationship about being in bed with the pet food manufacturers interferes with transparency. Because normally people think, well, if we can't trust the stuff in the supermarket, better buy the stuff we can get from the vet. So I've talked, f oh no, two more, two more things. I didn't, I put this in after I knew you were speaking from New Zealand. Do you know John Munday? He's a really good pathologist at, at Massey, trained in North America. And I was, I'm, he's a, the world expert on papilloma viruses. And I'm very interested in papilloma viruses in dogs and cats and how you treat papilloma induced neoplasia. And he's a really great research associate. So we were sort of chewing the fat about this particular problem. And he said, thanks for sending me this. Massey's just the same. Many of us are uncomfortable, I'm sure. It is really simple. Companies only sponsor because they see benefit. Hopefully the students are smart enough to realise this, but probably not. And then in a follow-up email, when I said this wouldn't happen in America, because I was told I've asked several people and they're a bit more careful, Hills was all over the Uni of Georgia, which is where he did his residency training. From memory, they sponsored Labco Day for new vet students and they sold Hills. Pet food at vastly reduced rate to the students' staff with the blah. And they do this all the time. They've got a Hills rep in every year and a Nestle Royal Cannon rep in every year and they're all pimping food and the students get it for free. And, and I grab it from them and feed it to my chickens. It's, I find it really good chicken food. <laughs> they thrive on it. No, it really, like, it's very expensive, but it's good chicken food. And finally, because I, I got in a shitload of trouble over this because Hills sent emails to the Dean. The Dean could say, oops, 400,000 funding is going to disappear all the time. Richard Malik's a huge pain in the ass. He has been in the past. He will be in the future. Let's get rid of the bastard. <laughs> it's true. Well, no, it's, I'm not a, no, it's not. But you know what I mean? I, I got a shitload of trouble and my boss got into trouble. Everybody got into trouble. And yet I thought I was in the moral high ground. And I got this really nice letter from Mark Dowden, which I copied and pasted. And it's my last slide, but I finish it. It's only, I just want you to hear authentic voices from other people. It's not like it's just me or it's just Lynn or it's just Pete or it's just your group. And Mark's very neutral. So let me read it. Hope, you've, hope you're well. Haven't spoken to you for 20 years. This was a really good vet, worked with um, Bob Zammett at Vineyard Veterinary Hospital and then having done that for about 20 years, he moved his family up to Salamander Bay, which is a really nice coastal place. He surfs every morning. He's got three kids, the same wife for 30 years. He's a really good guy, near the top of his year, omnicompetent vet, really good guy. It's been a long time since, and I've written about three papers with him. He's a really, okay. I've been reading a couple of articles on the ABC Media website that mention you in regard to the cat food controversy. It seems like it might have prompted a review that has been needed for quite a while, in my opinion. For quite a while, I've been troubled with the regard to funding by pet food industry going into the uni and the perceived and actual bias that this could cause in terms of research. Now, in addition to that, I've had contact with quite a few recent graduates. And that's sort of because he's had some really good people that I've sent his way to work there, but they will go off and have kids. So <laughs> he's seen qu quite a lot of them and how they change um, over time. And I've been appalled by, A, their lack of nutritional knowledge in any depth whatsoever, because he went through like me and had 80 lectures, he's a couple of years younger, and by the severely biased, one-eyed approach that they have had respect with nutrition. I was appalled to learn that rather than being lectured by well-credentialed research scientists, like David Fraser or John Mercer or Frank, I can't remember, all the people that taught us in the nutritional field, they now receive their nutrition lectures from Hills reps. It's not surprising they now completely uncritically can spout the Hills company line with regard to any clinical problem. I had one young vet here as a locum who honestly believed there was a food in the alphabet of Hills diets to fix whatever the current problem was. And the animal simply could not go home without it. She regarded it as heresy to question some of the fairly shaky ground that a lot of the claims were based on, let alone contemplate the possibility that any of the foods might actually cause problems under certain circumstances. It's not just vet students from Hills that have managed to indoctrinate. All the veterinary nurses are taught, taught nutrition by Hills reps. I'm not in the Tom's Lonsdale camp, but I've always questioned critically, sounds like Martin, any information supplied to me with regard to nutrition or anything else. 
especially when it is supplied by someone with a vested interest. He writes well, doesn't he? Cheap Evet, far better than me. I would have waffled on for ages. I remember in my student days when the mantra was all about calcium imbalances in raw diets, exactly how much bone the average dog would need so it wouldn't get nutritional or secondary hypothyroidism. I resolved to continue feeding my dogs with raw appropriate size bones. I don't have a problem with feeding a bit of commercial food. I do think some of the prescription diets have a place. So I'm certainly no zealot for the raw feed meaty bones camp. But I do have a think it's very important to address the issue of who is providing the information to students. Of course, it's the other sponsorships that I'm unaware of that I think that should apply to them too. I thought I would write to you partly to offer support if I could, as it seems there will be some effect to isolate and marginalise you by the pet food people. And I'm sure we'll have plenty of respected veterinarians who would be prepared to do the same. And in fact, there was a few of them visiting my boss on quite a regular basis. <laughs> I don't know. It's just I feel really strongly about this. And so since I'm largely preaching to the converted, you've all gone to trouble to do extra reading and extra thinking and you've enacted things that work for you, whether it's a complete commitment or an in-between commitment or it's just being open to some of the ideas. But you can't let the people indoctrinate the vet students. It is just like Goebbels in the Second World War. I'm almost done. My final slide is just to remind you that I have an open sense of humour. <laughs> I'm sorry if it's really been all over the place, but I just wanted to talk about the bigger issues that I think underpin all of this. Thank you so much for listening.